Hi, uh, welcome to another session of the Houdini training. My name is Gianvito Serra, and today we are going to look at how to add materials to our digital assets. Um, now, this is a continuation from the last session that we had, where we actually added UVs to the uh, to the to the column generator, um, and this is also coming from it being a object level asset now. Okay, so okay to go ahead and actually do this work. The first thing we want to, so continuing from the last video where we were here, uh, the first thing that we want, we're ready, so just to recap, we, uh, what we did is that we actually set up this digital asset to, in addition to creating the column, that we can create actual UVs, okay? And the UVs are fully deterministic so that we can actually modify, you know, our column, and UVs autom aut automatically adapt to actually match the final look of our column, okay? Uh, if you remember, uh, this particular uh, column generator is now part of a larger digital asset called column asset, okay? Which contains basically the column generator right here, which generates a model and UV, as well as an export subnet where we export a triangulated version of the actual column for our engine, okay? Now, once we actually have a digital asset set up in such a way where we have a, you know, a object network, okay, which actually contain all the different nodes, we can start doing a lot of more things in addition to just saying open exporting pipeline. For example, we can add a material, um, and I'll go ahead and I'm gonna go ahead and show you a little bit how that works. So the first thing I wanna do, so I wanna go ahead and actually hide my UVs. So we're looking at just the column. And I'm going to get started to add a material, okay? To add a material in Houdini, the first thing that we need is a, what is called a shop network, as in shopping. But a shop network stands for shader operators, okay? And it's a network where we can actually put a multi, where we can actually create material or use material presets to actually uh, shade objects that we have on the viewport, okay? Do last week from the last session, uh, from the session where we actually build an exporter, you saw how we create a rock network to be able to export this file to an FBS. We're now adding a shop network to actually be able to add materials to this asset. Okay, so let's take a, a closer look to the what the shop net looks like. So if we come in here, anytime that we go into a new network, if we press tab, you will notice that the menu changes, and now all of a sudden we have all sorts of new nodes. Uh, these particular ones are actually associated with baking, uh, actually, sorry, with rendering and shading, okay? So we have a shadow shaders, we have displacement shaders, we have uh, atmospherical shaders, etc., etc. We have uh, several material builders and things of a sort. So like many procedural shaders, okay? Now, one thing to understand, okay, and this is a very important distinction to make, is that what we're actually looking at here is basically utilities for building shaders or materials, okay? It is not, for example, a collection of material types, like it is not like metal or fong, and it's not like uh, a clay shader or anything like that, but it's atomical opera material operators, which allows us to create all sorts of different presets of shading, such as, for example, you know, we talk like, you know, so like a metal shader, like an actual like plastic shader, you know, the, a lot of those will be simply mantra surface shaders, okay? But for example, we could also create uh, volumetric shaders, uh, which allows us to do stuff like uh, like fog, like for example, explosions, uh, like billowy smoke, etc., etc. Um, so we could start this tutorial by going to material and actually creating a material shader builder, which will allow us to create a material from scratch, okay? But we're not going to do this for this tutorial. I'm gonna save this for a different tutorial where we'll look into material creation. Instead, I'm gonna show you how to use the material presets that Houdini has, okay? So when we are inside of the shaders network, uh, if we click on the icon over here, the tool palette, you will notice that in addition to the tab menu, which we have down here, we also have a gallery menu up here, okay? The gallery menu contains presets of the nodes that are inside of here, and most of these nodes were actually created using, like, the, for example, the Material Shader Builder, okay? 
But in here we'll have, for example, uh, several shaders such as the mantra surface, the displacement shader, the principal shader, surface model. You know, we have, for example, hair shader, skin shader. Uh, we'll have like some natural shaders like clay, dirt, marble, etc., etc. You know, we will have uh, all our metals here as well. Okay. We can, you know, at any point drop any of these presets in our network. Okay. And assign them to our objects by simply dragging and dropping into the objects. Okay. Very cool. Some of these will actually look better once you actually render, which we'll show you here. Uh, we, to actually do a render on the viewport that we have here, we can use the IPR render window, which is this little icon below the actual camera. When we click on this icon, we can drag a rectangle over our object and actually see a render of our object right there in the viewport, while we can still rotate and scale and do whatever we want, you know, in the viewport, okay? We can even go as far as to right click on this window and say blend with viewport, which then makes it a little bit more seamlessly blended into our viewport. Okay. Very cool. If at any point we're done with the rendering, we can always close the little window by clicking on the edge here. And that goes back to the OpenGL shader. Okay. Cool. So what we want to do for this tutorial is that I want to actually work with a simple marble shader. Okay, this is a very simple shader, and I'm going to create, for the purposes of this tutorial, just a very simple uh, marble texture uh, using uh, procedural composite operator networks, okay? Just to show you a bit of how you can go about doing some simple shading in here. So let's delete, let's go ahead and assign a marble to my object, and let's delete some of this stuff that we don't need here. Once we drop the marble preset in here, we can come in here and actually start adjusting, for example, the, the, the diffuse. We can, for example, to the diffuse intensity. We can start basically playing for, to, with our material settings, you know, to actually get a different look, you know. We can, for example, adjust the base color. Uh, we can even come in here and start adjusting the reflection uh, and all of that stuff, okay? All of this stuff that we see in Houdini is actually using is actually using APB, the APBR model, okay, physical base rendering model, which is very important for getting being able to pro generate a realistic uh, shading. Uh, we have different models that we can actually use, but right now we're using the DGH uh, model for uh, or uh, lighting or for reflection. Uh, but there, and there is a lot of parameters that obviously we can explore with each one of these shaders to, for example, to handle subsurface, refraction and reflections, etc., etc. Even parameters for handling the bump and normals, uh, displacements, uh, and even some parameters to specifically control the OpenGL section of uh, the materials. Okay. So we can choose if we wanted to use the point colors or not, or even if we wanted to use, for example, a map to use on our shaders okay uh, houdini supports all sorts of different features related to actual uh, shading you know including udim expansion uh, which if you are familiar with programs like mari you are familiar with the ability of using udim, UDIM mapping okay the map section is here in this particular shader uh, the map is where we can actually assign a color map okay and we can even assign for example the default mandrill image that comes with houdini so that you can see you know, your image mapped into your surface. Okay? So it's very simple. Now, when we drag and drop a shader like this, what we're actually doing is that we're actually assigning the shader to the actual object node. Okay, so if we go to material here, we'll see that now we have the actual path to the actual marble material we just created. Okay? Now, because I want my digital asset to be fully self-contained and not have object references to absolute paths, we can go ahead and actually make this a relative path. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and actually go up one level from here to make this a path that is a relative path, okay? I mean, likewise, we can always go also to the, inside of the geo object, we can also go to the material tab and simply browse to where our shop net that contains the material that we want to actually attach here. Okay, show that again. 
and click on this and actually navigate through your scene. You know, in this case, I'm gonna go into my column asset two, which is where I am, and just pick the material that is inside of a shop net that I just created. Okay, and I'm gonna set my path to relative. All right, cool. Now, if we actually, we can use this to jump back to the material here. And from here, we can actually start playing with the parameters as well. Okay. Say we actually wanted to assign two materials. Okay, we wanted the caps to have one material, and we wanted the actual base to actually have a different material. Uh, and I want, say, the caps to have the clay and the marble to actually be on the base. We will do so a little bit different. Uh, instead of assigning the material via the material section here, we will actually assign it inside of a sub network. So we will basically in here uh, open our digital asset. And actually, I wonder if we already have groups or recaps. No, unfortunately, we do not. But basically, we'll open our digital asset. We can simply use material operators inside of any sub network to assign materials on a per phase basis. Okay, so for example, on this one side, which is the side that handles my column, I'm going to browse for the marble. And on this side, which handles my caps, I'm going to assign the clay. Okay, now we'll come down to the bottom. Now you will see that we can actually assign two materials to the same object, okay? There you go. Now, for the purposes of this class, obviously we only really care about our actual surface operator or actual column to actually have really one material. We don't need a top and a bottom material right now, okay? So because of that, we're going to go ahead and actually revert the change that we did, you know, by simply right-clicking on my column generator node and saying match current definition, okay? Which is gonna reset it back to the way it was. But, and we're gonna go ahead and assign the material at the object level, okay? So let's go back here and go to get our marble and let's assign it, cool. Now you'll notice that the marble doesn't have a texture assigned to it, okay? And you can actually just assign textures that you have saved on disk. So for example, if you have an image on disk that is your, uh, then you know that it is your marble, that you have your own marble texture that you painted in Photoshop. You can certainly assign that in here as well by simply going to the material and then assigning it to the map section right here, okay? Now, another way that we can do this, which is also very a cool, a very neat thing that we can do in Houdini, is that we can also use a composite operator network to create procedural textures, okay? So if we go back out, we can add a new context here called a COP network context, okay? The COP network context, if you remember from our context class, is the context where we actually have composite operators. Okay, so if we go inside of a cop net and we press tab, you will notice that our nodes are again completely different. Okay, they are nodes that are associated with doing image operations, and we can use to actually, which we can use to actually operate on images. Okay, so very cool stuff. But what we want to do for this particular one is that we wanted to go ahead and add a, another file, but I want to go ahead and add a noise operator. Okay, let's take a look at what that looks like. If you are in the cop in a cop net and you want to see your images, on the very top here next to scene view, simply switch to the composite view. And this will actually then switch Houdini into loading the compositor, okay? So we can see now that we're actually looking at the image that we have here. We can play with the parameters in the image and just see the images actually be modified on the fly based on the settings that we're having here. Just like you would in the scene view with geometry, okay? Cool. But is really neat is that we can also, obviously in here we can also be looking at the channel. So we can see the red channel, the green channel, the blue channel, and even the alpha channel. Um, we can also simply, we can also in here, you know, do things like, for example, adjust the image size so that we have the, so that we have the proper image that we're looking for. 
and this one I think I want to go for a 1024 by 1024 image okay so we just have a square image of a certain resolution whoops very cool now one thing that we can do that is really cool is that you can actually assign these nodes to actual materials inside of Houdini okay and the way how we do that is by simply going back to our material okay so we're gonna go ahead and navigate to where our material is and I'm gonna go ahead and actually lock my window here so that we can see the parameters of the material while I'm actually navigating around okay so going back to my copnet we can now drag and drop the noise parameter onto the map okay which is gonna give me this and actually change the syntax to have op colon here what this does is that it tells Houdini to look at this compositing node and temporarily save what you see in here in memory as a file so that it can be referenced to the body shader uh, dynamically okay what's very neat about this is that if we go back to scene view you will notice that now our noise pattern is actually applied to the actual procedural geometry okay and if we go and start modifying our noise you will notice that it actually modifies on our column much like this was modifying in the actual image view here okay so this is really cool because it allows Houdini all of a sudden to be able to do procedural texturing okay which is something that you know is a feature that not a lot of people realize we can do here but it's something that we can certainly do okay and we can generate in addition to obviously color maps we can generate normal maps spec maps etc etc really anything we want okay so let's play a little bit with this noise to see if we can get something that looks good okay so one thing i want to do for example is to get rid of the alpha channel okay so let's go ahead and actually do go to my image tab and see where it says image planes let's switch to only outputting the color channel okay so now we're actually looking at just the channel the color we can even click on this to disable the lighting and just look at my texture flat shader and we can see the effect of the noise in here okay we can adjust the frequency we can adjust the roughness of the noise yeah we can start playing to see if we can actually get something that can look a little bit kind of like a marble effect that we wanted to see okay so let's start with this for now okay now let's go ahead and actually drop a new node which in this case is going to be a blur just to blur the effect a little bit now you will notice that when I added the blur uh, my actual uh, material didn't really change okay and that is because my material node is actually pointing to the noise operator and not the blur operator okay so if we go back to the material you will notice that I'm pointing to the noise and not the blur well that's cool but it's not good because now I won't be able to see I have to keep updating this path every time I update the node which is not ideal okay so we can fix that go ahead and, let's go ahead and lock the material view again by clicking on the little tab here and let's navigate over to the copnet okay now what you can imagine we can just drag the blur in here and that will immediately fix the problem right but what we can do which is even better is to put a null node at the very end and call it out Oops. and simply have this node be the one that we reference here okay so we can just go in here and just replace noise with out and now you can see that the effect of a blur shows up on my material whoops let's see it's a little bit dim to see but you can kind of see it there okay wonderful okay now what happens now because of this if i add any new nodes like for example a transform node as i'm actually adding new nodes and i'm coming here and actually rotating parameters you will see that everything updates on the fly which is awesome okay so what i want to do in here is that i want to actually get my nodes to actually scale a little bit okay so we want to actually get at get it to be for example 10 on the Y 
So it's a very, kind of like a very stretchy noise, maybe two, okay? And then we want to go ahead and actually just rotate it a little bit, okay? You will notice that when we rotate, though, we're actually adding some of the alpha showing up here. And if we look at the composite view, you will notice that my image is actually kind of getting clipped right here, okay? So what we want to do is to actually switch the image warp from black to mirror, okay? So that actually now makes it a little bit more continuous, okay? Can even, there's other modes that we can do here. We can also do repeat. And, but mirror will allow you to just mirror it over on the other side, okay? Cool. Now if we go back over here, now we get our column with a little bit of more noise. So, once we actually have this, we can continue modifying our settings here to just to get a little bit of, still a little bit if we can get the effect that we want, okay? Something like this. We can now put an edge detect operator, which should give us uh, some edge detection. Uh, let's just make sure that our mask is not, we're not getting the uh, alpha that is black. So let's make sure that our effect doesn't go into the alpha, okay? But only on the color. And that's basically, I will show how I did that before, you know, this was not showing up because this thing was set to also do the sobel effect on the alpha, which was black, okay? Well, we basically want to tell here by going into the mask parameter tab, which most operators in COPS have this, is that we can actually turn off the alpha effect and then it will just leave the alpha alone. It will only affect the red, green, and blue, okay? We can, of course, do the same thing if we wanted to just operate on just the red, for example, but we can do these kind of things to actually do a different effect, okay? So we can try some different noise types and then see just the different effects that we get. Okay? And now, because we actually fit the alpha, we should see the effect even in our column, okay? Very cool. Now the next thing I want to do is that I want to actually reduce the amount, go ahead and actually start playing with the hue and saturation and value. So I'm going to drop an HSV node, as in hue saturation value, and go ahead and actually reduce my saturation, okay? So it starts looking a little bit more like a column, but then, and also increase my value, and then, which I think is probably the value shift that we want to do. Okay, but not losing, in such a way that we don't lose the actual then we don't lose the actual effect that we have here, okay? So we can see it's starting to look a little bit more like marble, okay? And we're getting a little bit more of that kind of marble effect. Can even add a little bit of a... You can even add an equalize node, which will allow us to... which will take it and actually stretch the range in between black and white, okay? Which gives us a little bit more of that contrast that we want, okay? Let's go ahead and actually play even a little bit more with the saturation so that we get something that has just a little bit of a color bleed that you will get from this, but not too much, okay? And then on the equalize, we can reduce the amount of effect that we're actually doing on the marble, okay? Very cool. Last, we'll go ahead and add a little bit of... Uh, as we'll go ahead and actually put a little bit of sharpening, okay? And just get just a little bit of sharpening on my actual on my actual marble veins, you know, so that we get just a little bit of that in there. And I think this is probably good for this particular class. Okay, so we're having a cool little marble. We have a very cool little uh, effect that we have here with the actual marble. And it was all done completely procedurally, okay? Uh, one last thing that I'd like to add is to actually make it so that we can actually do UV tiling on this, okay? So we can do tiling in many different ways. You know, we can add, for example, a transform node here and simply scale our image to get a little bit of tiling, okay? Oops, only a little bit less. Let's color image and get a little bit more tiling going on. Okay. 
We can also do that, of course, on the actual UVs if we wanted to, you know. And the nice thing about doing in the UVs is actually that we get more resolution, of course. So if we go back to our column geo, we can even add it as a node right here and actually do a UV transform. And be able to add a little bit more repeatability to the UVs, okay? Very cool. Okay, so now that we can control the tiling, uh, one thing that we will notice, let me go ahead and hide the wireframe so we can see a little bit better, is that we do have a little bit of seaming happening, you know, because of the tiling that we're doing, you know, and even at the UV seams. So uh, we do need to make this texture actually tileable. Otherwise, as we actually increase our tiling, you know, we're gonna see the seam actually kind of showing up there, which is not a great thing. Okay. We can fix that also in the copnet by doing a few adjustments, okay? So we go back to the copnet and we look at our composite view. Uh, instead of actually having the rotation happen here in our transform node, we can actually make the rotation happen in the UVs, which will take care of actually rotating these pixels without actually distorting them, uh, you know, based on the fact that this is a square image, okay? So let's select our transform node here and let's simply zero out the rotation. Okay, so we now have uh, this pattern actually going tall. Cool. After doing that, we can add a tile cop node, okay, which will allow us to make our image tileable. Okay, you can do that by simply mirroring on the axis so that we actually get something that is infinitely tileable. Okay. Just to demonstrate this, if I another tal operation and actually just use it to do an offset, you will notice that no matter where I move, things will always be 100% tileable. Okay. Very cool. So with that go I'm gonna go ahead and actually keep this little offset that I have here just to actually break up the pattern a little bit more. Okay, I'm not gonna worry too much about the pattern right now, just because for the purpose of this tutorial, but just to actually show a little bit of some other things that we can do. If we go back now to the column asset, we will see that we now have the column, but the although the UVs are actually just going up and down, but we don't see any more tiling anymore, okay? Cool. So what we can do now is to simply come to our column geo now, and to our UV transform, add a rotate on the UVs to actually give it a little bit of rotation. Okay, not on this side, but perhaps on this side. Oops. It's actually easy. It's a little bit easier if we see the UVs. Okay. And let's see if we can actually get the UVs to rotate. Oh, actually we want it on the Z axis, right? Because it's the axis that the UVs are actually facing me. Okay, so we're gonna do 245. And if we go back to our perspective viewport, you will notice that now we have the actual rotation of the UVs in here. Okay? We'll probably reduce some of the tiling a little bit, you know? But we're able to now get, you know, this to be, you know, pretty seamless all across by actually using the, by actually being able to use the, uh, a tileable, a textual that is fully tileable. Okay? Very cool. We can go back over here and just adjust a few things. I would think I want to actually, one of the things I want to probably do is to maybe reduce the weight of the effect a little bit by just adding another HSV node. And just actually reducing the, actually, you know what? I want to add a contrast node and use that to just kind of reduce the actual contrast of the full effect. Okay, so just about to here. I want to again make sure that we're not actually affecting the alpha, so let's turn that off. Okay. And let's look at this with the shading. Okay. Awesome. So yeah, at this point we actually now have a procedural texture which generates a you know a pattern here for the actual uh, for the actual uh, marble effect that we're looking for. Very cool. Um, 
At this point, we can go ahead and actually save our column asset, digital asset. So we say save node type. And we can save match current definition to actually lock it down, okay? But we can even do a few more things now because we now have the materials exposed. We can promote some of the parameters that are part of the materials. So we can do a lot of editing of content. We go to type properties to go to the parameters and create a new folder for some material parameters, okay? So we're gonna go ahead and create a new folder. I'm gonna call this material, pa material parameters. Okay, and I'm going to go in here and promote some of my some of my controls from the copnet. So, for example, I want to promote my contrast of a grain. I want to promote my uh, let's see what else would be the offset. Let me see. Okay. Maybe even promote the noise, the seed of the noise. Okay, and we'll call this like marble seed. Okay, and then from the material, we're gonna go ahead and actually promote some of the settings that we have here as well. So we'll go ahead and actually promote, for example, the Reflection intensity. We call this uh, reflection intensity, and then we'll also promote the roughness. Okay. We'll rename some of this a little bit more clear. So marble tile offset and marble contrast. put this in here as well to make sure that we have the names on all of our parameters here okay and then we can hit accept now if we go to the top you will notice that now we have these parameters exposed okay so we can come in here and actually control for example the reflectivity intensity of the actual column you can kind of see a little bit here and even overdrive it if you want it to go really high. Okay. And we can even control, for example, the roughness. If we want it to make it more plastic or less plastic. Okay. Just to show you how you can actually promote parameters in a material, you may or may not want to actually do so if you actually just want something that is just marble. Okay. Now we even have the controls here from the actual compositing network to be able to control, for example, the look of a marble and everything, right? Now, however, you will notice that when we move these ones, um, it doesn't look like anything is changing, you know, compared to when we were actually moving them inside of a cup net, okay? That is because uh, this particular node type is an object node, and very much like a sub node, or like surface operator node, it is only responsible for modifying geometry or controlling transforms and things of the sort, right? Really has no business updating textures. Um, to do so, what we want to do is to be able to be able to explicitly tell Houdini that every time that in this digital asset we actually change these parameters, we want the actual texture cache to be clean so that we can actually see the texture update. Okay? And that's very easy to do. If we go right click again and go to the type properties, we can go back to the parameter the three parameters that actually control the uh, marble look okay so the marble C the marble tile offset and the marble contrast okay well, we have them all selected here all that we need to put in this param thing right here the callback script is the command text cache minus C okay I'm gonna make it nice and big here so you can see it text cache minus C okay well, so let's explain a little bit. So what this command does is that it simply flushes the texture cache of Houdini so that it forces Houdini to refresh the, the, the 3D view 
every time that you run this command, okay, to actually be able to show you what is in here, okay? It basically removes the textures out of the cache so that you actually have to refresh the textures, okay? By putting them in this area, the callback script, what we're actually telling what Houdini does is that every time that something changes on one of these sliders, so like when I move a slider, when I change a parameter on the slider, when I change a string, it will run this little script so that every time that I actually move the slider, it will actually clear the texture cache so that we can actually see my texture update, okay? Very cool. So we're just gonna go ahead and actually hit accept. And by the way, when you select all the parameters, if we look in here, every single parameter has that change on it. So we're gonna hit accept. Okay. And now notice that when we actually play with this parameter, we actually are able to control now the contrast of a marble. And even if we want to the actual offset of a marble through my surface. Okay, almost as if it were basically the controls that would allow me to give the procedural texture, okay? Can you control the seed of the marble? If you want to randomly change the actual direction of the veins, okay? Very cool. Close this. And even if we come here and actually change the color of a column, we should see that some of the previous parameters still work in the context of you know, the look of my column, okay? All right, so when we're done with these changes, and now we have our column settings here, which allows us to control the, uh, which allows us to control the actual grooves and the look of the column. We have the controls for actually doing the height. We have the controls to actually doing the radius. So just like we've seen before, we also now have controls to even control the actual look of the shading of the actual column okay very cool nice so we're gonna go ahead and right click on this and then save our node type and we're going to go ahead and match current definition to actually lock it down okay okay looking a little bit closer at the aspect uh, i also noticed that I did notice that there is a little bit of a seam still happening here, which is something that I think we need to correct. Uh, and this is something that obviously we can fix very simple. It was just an oversight of my part when setting this up. Uh, if we allow editing of contents again, we'll go back to the column geo here. You will notice that we added a UV transform which scales and rotate the UVs. Well, the problem with that is that even though the texture may be tileable, uh, it may that still won't make, ensure that the where the UV sends they will actually end up in corresponding places for these to always um, be tellable. Okay, so we're gonna take a slightly different approach to that. We're gonna first revert this back to default so that all my scales are back to one, and we're gonna set this to zero. And so before I do, I'm gonna go back to non shader mode so you can see the scene a little bit better. When we we'll go back to zero rotation, you will notice that we don't have a seam anymore. Okay. Instead of actually using rotations and scales, what we can do is use a shear. What a shear is doing is just stretching the UVs so that it's giving us a similar a sense of what we were actually getting with the rotation, where it's looking like the actual pattern of the actual marble is going on an actual angle, but without necessarily uh, do, but in a way that is also seamable because in this point at this particular point when you actually look at the UVs they're actually sharing to actually account for that particular rotation similar to the rotation because we're doing the sharing on the UVs it is ensuring that it's using like full full point precision when we do the sharing therefore we're actually not losing we shouldn't be losing any precision when we actually do that what you will notice that we, the thing that we used to be able to do with the scale was that we were also to be able to reduce the, am the amount of repetitiveness on the pattern, which we kind of lost by not being able to actually use scales. We could use a scale on the edge, but that basically then affects the amount of shearing that we have, so it's not ideal. Instead, what we're going to do is that we're going to we're going to adjust the actual repetitiveness of the actual pattern right inside of the uh, right inside of a cup network. 
So we're going to promote one more parameter to our digital assets. So we're going to right click on this and go to type properties. We're going to go back to our copnet. And we're going to add this, pass, this spatial frequency parameter. Just to show a little bit what that does. If we go back to our composite view and just look at this and just denoise by itself. The spatial frequency just increases the amount of frequency that the noise have it has in space, right? If we see the effect on the full texture that we have here, what you still have is basically your texture being tiled less and less or more, depending on how much we want to actually keep it. Okay? So it gives us kind of the same effect that we're looking for, but with actually having to uh, work with the UEs. So we're going to go to the same place where we actually have all of our marble parameters. And we're going to go ahead and drag and drop the frequency parameter too. And we'll call this marble frequency for a little more consistency. And we'll do marble frequency here. And just like we added the text cache, cache command on the other parameters, we're going to go ahead and actually add that to the marble frequency as well. Very cool. We're going to accept. And go back to scene view here. And let's take a look at how our new parameter works. So there's a marble frequency. We can slide it and we can see now that the marble, it's the, the repetitiveness of the marble actually is affected by the frequency. And we can tune individually the X and the Y as well. But our texture always remains fully tileable by doing so. Okay. And with that, we're going to go ahead and save the operator. Okay, and we're going to match definition. All right, and that concludes uh, this particular video. We will continue uh, to explore more, uh, you know, more of the material pipeline in uh, the next videos on how to actually push some of these materials in Unreal. But thank you for watching.